<clears throat> Hello. So So let's give people a minute to join here or so. Um, due to the issues with the meeting password. And I also put it into the documentation. Ah, oh, there it is now. The image has put it in there. All right, as always, I'd ask you to add yourself to the meeting notes. Seems to be. Yeah, let's give people maybe a couple more minutes to join before we jump into the topics right now. Everyone. Hello. Okay, then let's get started. Let's see how more people are showing up. Um, so for today, a couple of updates. The first one is on the operator working group. Um, uh, when I joined the last couple of meetings, um, we decided to merge the working groups back into uh, the main meeting here from the presentation and working perspective, also because they are at least some of those meetings that did not really have, have didn't have a lot of attendance. We also had uh, like very low attendance altogether. So we thought let's move it into the main meeting. Also some of those meetings, I tried to join them. Nobody really showed up to those meetings. So we try to put the work back into one meeting and we can split things further out as we know, but obviously people can focus on uh, what they're interested in. And this is uh, true for both the air gap work as well as the work on uh, the, the operator definition. Uh, let me just quickly share here my screen. So um, the first topic um, I want to work on, uh, look into is the, that working document we had on the, the operator definition. So this document has been around for, for quite a while now with, uh, I'd say, limited progress on the document per se. Uh, I, last meeting I took the action item to comment pretty much on all the action items that were in there in this document and uh, to, to really move this forward. So this was also requested by the TUC that we come up with a um, a, a better documentation for, for a better definition of what, what an operator is. And uh, I'll just briefly take the time to go over 
um, a, a couple of items here. So the first discussion item was that this related technology section in here. Um, it created some kind of confusion. People said, well, this is not uh, necessarily presented right. Not all technologies are in there. And the last time we already discussed that uh, for the related technology part, it's not even really necessary for this document. So they go over the document to, to describe what an operator is, but not necessarily to uh, define what other um, possibilities are out there to run uh, different technologies and what um, could be used as an alternative to some of the capabilities of an operator. So the proposal was to, to remove this section. This has been now around for um, almost a month to, to remove the related to other technology approaches session. So the question is, does anybody object? We just remove the section and really focus on the core definition of the operator. Um, I think it would make sense to um, describe some other technologies in a, in, in a short um, in short sentences, but only to distinct between between the operator and other and other technologies. So I think we should um, we should define when when an operator totally makes sense and when does it make no sense. So when it's when it's better to use Helm charts or other things. But is it really our job to tell people when they should be using which technologies? When the main goal was just to describe what what an operator is. Mm, no, I don't think so. And that was the driver because then that this was like Matt's comment here. Uh, on the Helm side, this is not an accurate description of uh, what Helm is doing, which I might uh, agree with to some point. But nobody, so people were complaining, okay, this is not accurate enough the way we put it in there. Um, at the same time, there was no update. So my point was let's focus on describing what the operator is, how it works how it's supposed to work and leave this section out because it created a lot of confusion in the past. This would make total sense, yes. And we have some, some others in there. I mean, if somebody wants to take the section to a level where it's fine, we can leave it in there. So Thomas, if you want to take it. Um, I could try it until the next meeting. Yeah, so please get in touch with Matt, whether he's fine and uh, maybe some of the other projects. I think we don't necessarily need it, honestly. I think it doesn't really help us. Just taking a note here. So I'm not sure if someone read it. Um, I've posted what, uh, something on the, on the uh, mailing list to give the document a bit of another structure, but didn't get any response until now. So, um, yes, I think I'll also discuss this with, with Matt. Okay, so you get the action to remove it or not. Is there, uh, what do the other people think? Should we have it in there? Should we remove it? Maybe we can also discuss uh, your offer uh, later on in here. Do you provide a link to your document in here as well? I think we Okay, so let's look at some of the uh, other comments in here. This I want to later on discuss a bit. Um, I, I'm kind of struggling with this. Uh, so this was like a feature creep almost of this document. If you want to put it that way that say, who's the audience um, of this document? And we started well, the TUC requested it, which would mean it's a very technical audience, obviously. Uh, then we extended it to, to technically Kubernetes app developers and, and cluster operators, which I think also makes sense if you're building an app or if you're operating an app on a Kubernetes cluster, you should understand what an operator is, that, that totally makes sense. 
what I kind of is totally out of scope for me, a director of a non-Kubernetes company to understand what an operator is. Um, I was back then part of this meeting, but I think we are still struggling with the technical definition of what the operator is. Uh, so I, I remember that back then, the, 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 when we had this discussion was, yes, my, uh, my, my, my boss, he's not like super technical. I want to implement an operator and I want to give him a document that he understands why I want to do this. So my proposal is to remove non Kubernetes users from that operator uh, definition, especially if you don't understand how Kubernetes works, it's like very hard to understand what an operator is. And that, that I agree with that. That that is very vague because director in a company could mean different things depending on the company. Yeah, so my proposal is, is to remove this as a target audience. I mean, if we, could, if we want to have an operability guide later on, um, I'm fine doing this, but I think it just makes like super, super wide. So anybody oh, object? Okay. Or, yeah. okay, so then. Is, is there any reason why we are explicitly calling out app developers only in the line number two? Uh, why not, um, you know, DevOps, SRE kind of a person us? And SRE is the target audience. Yep. I mean, obviously, the, the CNCF TUC is, is, is a target audience, but I think the main, we're writing it because we're building it for the, on, on the TUC request. But I think that makes And so, um, and, and I removed the technical here. I think it's kind of like repeating itself. I have, for, <laughs> I have luckily rarely seen un, very few untechnical app developers. Cluster operators, and you said uh, SOEs. Yes. Good. Yeah, and uh, I'm also if you're fine, I'm removing the CNCF TUC to explicitly mention it. I think it's not adding. Uh, any massive value here. I mean, obviously it is for the TUC, but. Yeah, so just that, that I ask for your permission all the time. If you do not agree, simply speak up. Obviously, also if you agree and if you have an opinion, then um, I think that that would be good. So this is, uh, you, so you're either developing an application, you're running a Kubernetes cluster, or you're an SRE that is obviously responsible for an application that is running in Kubernetes. Good. I know this sounds like baby steps, but it is some progress here. So uh, just making the note in here. Okay. Audience remove. So, so an, an operator is an in-cluster application which uses a declarative paradigm for the installation, configuration, and operation of an application. That was a comment that um, that Tom uh, put in there in the working group. So, I think the only discussion in here is um, what about operators that are built for non-Kubernetes cluster resources. Something like ACK. I don't know whether you're familiar with ACK, but ACK is the uh, operator that allows you to manage Amazon 
EC2 uh, or AWS resources. So here you go, this is like a, well, technically they're not calling it an operator, they're calling it a, a controller for Kubernetes. And I think that the, the bigger question here is, I think how you look, I had this conversation with uh, Cornelia last week in the operator meeting because due to some mix up, both of us uh, uh, showed up in that uh, meeting and had some discussion. I think it's still how you see um, Kubernetes. Do you see Kubernetes as more or less as a platform to build platforms? and to operate this as a core concept in there? Or do you see it really as a, a means to run container type workloads? Because ACK is an example here. It is, maybe this is something we could put uh, Thomas in the related technologies. Mm. How do we, they even say that it's just a control. They don't name it to call it out as an operator because it's not managing anything inside uh i think uh, uh, this is similar to crossplane isn't it sorry this is similar to crossplane isn't it so also just a set of controllers and control planes to build other other platforms or to control other other things I think it's the, uh, what I still like to do in here. I think that sentence per se is not wrong. I just want you to. Operators help its consumer to manage the life cycle of the resource without the need to run any code. Yeah, I mean, we can, so because I think none of these comments had like a lot I would really move the out of cluster discussion to, there you go. I would rather make a separate comment for this one. And Then obviously it goes deeper into can, this, yeah. Can an operator be used to update an, um, another operator? Theoretically, yes, I think so. Should we include that then? Because it's only talking about applications. Unless we start call operator is another application. I mean, if, if we are, I think if we, we could be more precise what we mean by, by an application for inside of Kubernetes, because in Kubernetes, there is nothing that's an application. You have a number of resources that you can update in Kubernetes and an application is none of those resources. So technically, if you would define an application, you would need to have a custom COD. Yeah, I think that that's actually a good point. It should be should name what, what you can actually control or what you should be controlling with it. I'm just adding this here as a, sorry, as a comment. I think you cannot double comment, can I? I think another application could be replaced against um, a set of objects or objects or however you want to you want to name it. Yeah, I think we should name the objects that you usually control by it. Like, yeah. 
But that's a good point. We should really call it out because an application per se does not exist. In the group. So, and I think then it goes into, okay, what an, an operator is not meant to do, monitor an application, they can observe and utilize metrics, logs and events to support the proper function, but they're not used to do that in a deeper sense. So yeah, I already commented on this one. I'm not really understanding what we mean here. Obviously there is a reconcile loop. But it's not a log ship or a log agent per se. I think this relates to the, but technically I could export, I could also write a CRD based on the resource. But yeah, it's not replacing a monitoring system. I think where this is coming from is this operator capability model that was initially coerced and Red Hat versus there's like phase one, which is basic install, then there's seamless upgrades for lifecycle deep insights and, and autopilot for, for an operator. Now, now that I read this document uh, a bit, with, with, with some distance, I feel at that point in time, I still have no idea how to, what to do, how to build an operator in Kubernetes. I think it's very abstract, but I don't know what it is. How, how do I build it? Like for my, if I'm the, the, the app developer, I still don't know what I should be building right now. I mean, we know you want to have a custom controller that is implemented. You should have a CRD for this custom uh, for the custom controller. There's a reconcile loop in which you should react to what you're doing, but not, none of this is anywhere here. So I I, I don't know how you feel about this, but this is I think we might want to go like one level deeper. Like this is if we talk about Kubernetes uh, operators context of Kubernetes. This is the core part of the Kubernetes architecture that's relevant to operators. And this is how you extend Kubernetes with like an, an operator or how you add additional functionality in there. And, and obviously there's, there, there's multiple uh, toolkits out there which you can use to build an operator. But if you look at the initial definition, Operator in there is because there is one in the Kubernetes documentation. Uh, no, operator pattern here it is. That's the aims to capture the aim of a, of a human operator who is managing a service or set of services. Human operators look after specific applications and services have deep knowledge of how the system how to behave, how to deploy it, and how to react if there are problems. People who run workloads on Kubernetes often like to use automation. Okay, that's fine. O operators in Kubernetes. Kubernetes is designed for automation. Out of the box, you get lots of built-in automation. You can use Kubernetes to automate deploying and running workloads, and you can automate how Kubernetes does that. Kubernetes controller concept let's you extend the cluster behavior. I think this is something we should put in there. You're extending what the cluster can do. So this is, I think, number one, that's not in there. It wouldn't be the, 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 the operator that does not manage. This is a way how you can extend a Kubernetes cluster with additional capabilities. Uh, you can use, uh, Let's see, extend the class of the pen. Modifying the code of Kubernetes, it's uh, without modifying the code of Kubernetes itself. Operators are clients of the Kubernetes APIs that act as a controller for a custom resource. So, okay, I think that's. I, I think that is a bit more specific, but what I think might, might be helpful is like having a picture, like 
usually when you have an operator like these are your major building blocks that, that, that you have in there, like your custom resource, your controller component. These are like, this is your reconciliation loop or this is your interaction with the Kubernetes API. This is what you basically build. Almost like that, uh, might still be like a 10,000 feet view of this, but a bit more focused on the, the, the developer here. There's a couple of more examples down here, like deploying an application on demand, taking and restoring a backup, handling uh, upgrades of the application code alongside related changes, blah, blah, publishing a service to applications, Simulating failure, a custom resource and another example is a custom resource and sample DB that you can configure into the cluster. A deployment that makes sure a pod is running that contains the controller part of the operator. A container image of the oper controller code that queries the control plane to find out what the sample DB will Actually, this putting this maybe in a graphics might be a in a graphic might be a nice way of actually describing it so first you have your custom resource then you have a deployment for a pod and a container that actually contains your uh, uh, that contains your controller well, here we have the container image Controller code that queries the control plane to find out what sample DP resources are configured, reconciliation loop. The core of the operator code is to tell the API server how to make reality match the configured resources. If you add a new sample DB, the operator sets up a persistent volume claims to provide durable data storage, a stateful set to run sample DB, and a job to handle the initial configuration. If you delete it, the operator takes a snapshot, then makes sure that the stateful set and volumes are removed. The operator also manages regular database updates for each sample DB resource. The operator determines where to create a pod that can connect to the database and take backups. These pods would rely on a config map procedure, blah, blah, blah. Okay, if the most common way to deploy an operator is to add the custom resource definition and accelerate the controller to the cluster. The controller will normally run outside of the control plane, much as you would run any containerized application. For example, you can run the controller in your cluster as a deployment. So I think that sample DB, This list, by the way, they also extended. I think the older documentation didn't have all of them in there. With CUDA, QBuilder, Meta Controller, and, and the operator uh, framework in there. But I think putting something like this in, uh, moving something like this over into the doc might actually be helpful. I think now I understand by like even having like a picture that says, okay, these are the components that you have. This is what it's doing. So if, if you do not disagree, I would move this part over. I think we need to then see how it better fits, fits in there. So this is the whole discussion that people don't like faces, but again, there was, this is December last year, so there were no more comments. So I'm just closing this one here as well. So what I, what I think would be a good idea if we have like this high level description, if you could have, and if you want to use the faces, we have a description how, what an operator usually always does in the individual faces. 
or how how it would like as per our sample DB example do certain things. Like how would it handle an upgrade? Obviously, this is not the only way to do it, but it gets more interesting when we talk about uh, full life cycle, especially also the deep insights uh, bits and pieces, how it would do that, and also like the, the autopilot type of approach, and at least having one example what it what it could be doing. Does this make sense? Um, yes, but uh, would it make sense to define a, uh, a sample use case at the beginning, such as the sample DB, and then um, this, then describe the, the uh, describe the whole operator thing based on that? Yeah, that, that's why I copied over the sample DB. Uh, uh, the question is, do we just take sample DB, or do we need a better use case? Hmm? I think starting with sample DB is not the worst of ideas as Kubernetes started with sample DB as well. I'm putting it in the notes. But this could be any sample application, so. We just need to just have one in there. We could also have an application that's more complex. Maybe one that has a stateful set that has some additional resources it's managing. Yes. Okay. Do you want to write it, Thomas? Yes, I will do. I'll do this. Yeah. Okay. This is also almost a year old and April. So the main takeaway was the way it, it, it the only way an operator right now can more or less monitor an application is via the, the Kubernetes API. So everything you can query via the API, it would know about it, like if a pod died or if something happened. Um, but I think an operator can monitor a bit more because you also can talk to the application itself. So you could monitor health endpoints, yeah. Yes. yeah okay, good more. Should we have a separate point maybe on the monitoring piece, how an, app, an operator could monitor the app? Um, as some kind of observability features are built into the operator SDK, as far as I know, I think it would make sense. Yeah. All right. Is, yeah, isn't closing. it slightly confusing for us to say that operators are not meant to then monitor an application, then talking about a few things to monitor? I mean, I feel like it's it's confusing saying that it's we're kind of conflicting ourselves in that statement. Yes. Yeah. You mean because further down here we talk about that we have those that are monitoring the application? Yeah, especially if it is one of the key phases. Um, yeah. I think the idea was that they are not replacing a monitoring system or like an observability system that you're running. And they only monitor the application to the extent that they need to do their job. That they are designed to. 
which technically doesn't them limit, limit them doing anything really. I'll, I'll put this in here. My be confusing given this is a Yeah, maybe we remove it. Or potentially we can add a, um, I, I don't know, some, something like the sample operator that we have, we could add a use cases. And in that use case section, we can see that not meant to use in this like prolonged monitoring of an application in Kubernetes. Yes, aren't the use cases the phases more or less like how do I do say like full life cycle management and if you zoom in here a bit you would have like backup failure recovery yeah, what do you think of the other yeah. yeah yeah but but it's a good point yeah. to describe like for this use case how you would actually address it so I like the idea what they took uh, the the way they took it in the community stop. Examples and making examples just capital case. I mean, this is not the only way it can be done. This is just like really one example on, on how things could be. Yeah, this is just the same model in a different way. I think there's just two ways on how to present that model. Okay, here we have the, the implementation that, that we discussed before, like the technical implementation. Just a quick question on the two diagrams. Should we include both the diagrams? Because the second one to me looks like sort of a representation of the Koran population, like basic install is high. And I mean, usually we use, we use diagram like that to show the population, not the life cycle or faces. Yeah, I, I personally don't think that we need both. And they're just repeating themselves as well. So. So you mean we were removing this one? Yes. So I'm just leaving it in there in case anybody wants to have it in there. I'm not expecting it, but just let people comment on it. So what do you think about this one? So I know we had this discussion a long time back. We said, well, we have to distinguish operators from controllers. The more I think about it, if you really go after use cases, this is what you can use an operator for. This is like an example of where able to use it to do different things. I don't really understand uh, why uh, why we should differentiate between operators and controllers because technically an operator uses a controller and is not another 
and is not competing with an op uh, with a controller. Well, here's a question then. Why do we even have the term operators if they're going to be synonymous with controllers? What's the point? There has uh, to be I a differentiating factor for it to be a useful, meaningful term. And I mean, it, it loses its original Coros purpose if we don't distinguish it from a controller. We're, we're, we're making it so different from the original purpose that it'll probably end up confusing a lot of people as well because it's gone so far away. I mean, I can have a controller that uses a shared informer against a core object. And could you argue that that is an operator? Just a, or, you know, just a built-in object. Is that an operator then? Uh, there's a difference, and I think it needs to be outlined. Um, yes, technically an operator is not the controller, that's true. But it's, uh, I, I think an operator is, is just an, enhan uh, an, an enhancement of a controller because it, it has additional features. So, so what is the difference and why? I mean, people need to know that. Right, we're, we're trying to explain it to people in plain English and they're gonna see controller stuff all over the place. And if we don't distinguish between the two, they're gonna go, what's the difference? That's why this question even came up. And if we say, well, there really isn't any difference, they're gonna say, why do we have the term operator? And then other people are gonna say, but Coros define this in a way that's very different than just a controller. Why are you redefining it to something that's just so general that it can be a controller? It's gonna raise a lot of questions if we don't answer this. So I think I've, I get your point. So uh, I think we should describe a bit about this. About this. But the, the question is, what's, what's the proposal? I mean, the way, if you again look interestingly at the Kubernetes documentation, they talk about the operator pattern. So is this more as a pattern, how you can manage workloads? They don't they go into, they, they provide insights on how you can implement it with Kubernetes uh, platform mechanisms, but it, it is a pattern on how to do things rather than it is like an actual, like core artifact of what, 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 what we're doing. I know eventually people are releasing operators, but if we look at here, it, like where the original documentation comes from, it just specifies the operator back pattern. So, so Matt, do you have a proposal on how to phrase this so that it helps people? How to, to say, I mean, operators are a subset of controllers that do a specific pattern. And that pattern is outlined in the definition of what an operator is. Yeah. So there are some controllers that implement that pattern and there are other controllers that don't implement that pattern. And I would probably give some examples of controllers that don't implement the operator pattern to distinguish them. And an operator pattern, by the way, isn't just controllers, right? Because an operator has to extend the API and a controller doesn't extend the API. So operator is a pattern also needs you to extend the API, right? Yeah, extend the API. The controller doesn't have to do Yeah, whoever has good ones, obviously comment and like good examples, but I'm putting this in here. Yeah, and then we are again at the related technologies and approaches section, which uh, Thomas has taken the action item to talk with uh, uh, 
the individuals, whatever we want to keep it. I think we don't necessarily need it. This is not the computation here. It should just help us to understand and just describe the concept and help people to use that concept. And not say this concept is better than, than other concepts that are out there. Good. I think there's some action items in this one for the next meeting to get to give it some updates, some some overhaul. Um, I know this is kind of like a bit painful to to get started with. I think that this will then get uh, be get, be more say rewarding once people who were looking and learn more about it will reference this document and say thank you to us for eventually having it put together. Um, but I know it's uh, it's a bit of a, uh, like say, a, a challenging task to get it done in the beginning. Okay, we are almost out of time, especially since we had to be able to come here a bit later. Um, just a quick update, the app delivery landscape that Harry was uh, kind of initiating. As not, not long and I will update us, so I would move this to uh, to the next meeting to talk about this. Also on the AirGap, on the AirGap working group that Telco is on, I reached out to them once. I'll I'll do it again for examples on on the AirGap environments and the work that uh, they'd like to see. Uh, the last one, I'll just take four minutes to talk about this one. So Harry and I for. Um, uh, this also came out of the last uh, meeting uh, where we discussed, well, okay, having a landscape is one thing, but you know, many people today are explaining about the CNCF landscape and it's, and you know, there's even puzzles of the CNCF landscape that you can buy because there's so many things in there. Um, and we came with, like, okay, let's build like a simple sample application that people can get started with and where they can use different technologies to try out, okay, how, like app, app delivery use cases uh, with it. And uh, so Harry and I decided, okay, let's also submit this to KubeCon and like show common examples and show it was a demo application. And last time I took the task to look into the demo application. The obvious one would be hipster shop because that's the most widely used. Uh, my takeaway so far, however, was that a hipster shop is nice to show a microservice application. It mean it misses a lot of things that are kind of crucial to um, to, a, to a more real world type of um, application. Like there's no stateful workloads in there. There's an issue for this. There's not really a database in there that needs to be upgraded and managed. Maybe even a database that itself is managed by an operator. Like, I don't know, like a VTest or something. Uh, obviously it's all like one version in one tier. So there is no blue green type of deployment. There is no canary releasing uh, capabilities in there by default. There's also no third party dependencies that might be uh, requiring any secret management. And there's also not multiple stages with multiple configurations. So it's kind of unsure how you would uh, handle like this application running, let's say in a pre-production and a production scenario with different secrets, um, how you would define it there. So these are just- so can, I, can I say, uh, uh, yeah. also to, to throw in another layer, they've been, uh, the end users have been putting out their radars lately. And there are certain things that they've put into certain categories within those radars of whether, you know, use it, trial, those kinds of things that have been typical to radars. I haven't looked, but does the um, hipster shop example actually follow the same patterns that they've talked about over in the radars, or is there a mismatch there? Uh, you mean on the technologies that they're using in hipster shop? Yeah, and, and the way they deploy it and, and what they use, does it actually follow what the end users have said these are the things that are in the the, uh, why, the adopt phase. Does it actually follow that? Or did, does, does it use things that are maybe more niches that the developers of Hipster Shop wanted to show off? I don't think that they want And I haven't looked at it, but it just occurred to me. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, 
<laughs> Interestingly, uh, this is the, the continuous delivery uh, landscape. The other one would mm -hmm. be the, uh, so what you have in here in the adopt phase, you have Flux and Helm in there. I think it, I'm not sure whether it uses Helm by default or it uses uh, just manifests. I think it uses both. And interestingly, if you look at the rest in there, I mean, there's Argo in there in the assess phase. Obviously it's not using anything Argo related. Uh, Jenkins X and Spinner person not in there as far as I know, you could probably use it. Uh, GitHub Actions, obviously not. Tecton, don't think so. Well, Travis, you could use Travis with it. And, and, and Flux in general also points out GitOps. Is the deployment model yes. that they talk about a GitOps deployment model in Hipster Shop? Uh, I check it out. I think uh, I would have actually to check whether you can deploy it in a GitOps fashion. Because, I, you know, if this is just one of those things, I mean, if the end users have, have said this, um, then maybe it's worth looking into uh, what kind of example shows off the patterns the end users already have. So we look like we're on the same page and we're actually not just showing off uh, cool technologies in the okay. CNCF, but we're actually showing off what the end users are saying are good ways to do things. And, and so I think um, it's, it's a nice way to have synergy because then you, we can actually say in the thing and the end users, we're talking about this and you'll see these same technologies. You can reference other things happening within the CNCF and show how they jive with each other. And so it's an opportunity to reference. Yeah, I think that's also what we eventually want to do. So I think we could also file requests to get to shop. I mean, if there's a better application out there, I, I'm more than happy to honestly look into it, but uh, I, I mean, if not, it were me uh, putting something together for a presentation, I would do two example apps. I would do one uh, that is a microservice app, and then I would do one that's a lift and shift, where you're taking a legacy app and running it inside of Kubernetes, um, because you end up with both situations a lot in what people want to do and how they've got to deal with. Because a lot of times, there's a lot of people who just bring over their big thing, run it in Kubernetes, and then break parts off of it, or just keep running the monolith there. And so sometimes having two things that show you, here's how these technologies and ideas can be applied to two separate things. You don't have to break it apart into microservices right away. It gives people real world path forwards that they're trying to work with. I don't have an example to tell you to use right now. Um, I'm just taking them. I just think that we should start maybe with the cloud native one first. Should be lift, not life. But as we as we have more 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 end users that also require it's okay, how can I move something over? It just gets a bit more complicated because then we also get well uh factor app discussion. Maybe we also figure out that certain things don't work uh, work that well. But I think that especially the GitOps approach is interesting. Also the state for workloads. Uh, I, I think we have to have the I mean, there is, if it's totally unrealistic to run an application that's not running a database. Well, sure. I mean, you can always take something like the Reddit approach, which is where they ran their databases in VMs and they ran them separately. And then they ran all their stateless services in Kubernetes because they weren't ready to do that migration. So they did a partial migration. Um, I don't know where it is today if they've uh, migrated their, their stateful workloads, but that was one way and it helped offset folks as they went through this with their different trust. They were very happy to do their stateful, their stateless stuff in Kubernetes. And then as they built up trust, they, you know, you can move over your stateful stuff. And I've seen a lot of people have those trust factors. And so I think it's good to have stateful stuff, but I also think it's good to talk about people as they build trust in these kinds of shifts to, to be know that there are options for them in the world of shifting. Thank <clears throat> you. 
I'm, I'm putting it in here. And uh, interestingly, for stateful uh, workloads, there is there is an open issue in in hipster shop. I mean, the other thing I found uh, taking it as that that reference application, and we also use it internally for some demos. If you really run it in a multi-stage environment, it's actually consuming quite a lot of resources. Uh, like running it in a three-stage environment requires quite some cluster resources, obviously. So maybe something a bit smaller might be easier for people to to experiment and, and, and use CNCF technologies. But I, I totally like the GitOps approach. Actually, it would be a nice one to see whether it can actually be deployed with Flux or how far it is a way to be able to be deployed in the GitOps mode. It should be easy. Okay, I think yeah, we are uh, already beyond on top of the hour for this one. So yeah, for the next one, there is obviously some work on the, the operator working document. And let's look into some of the, the landscape work and on the delivery landscape, uh, uh, I'll work with uh, our team over here to see whether we can actually use it like in a flux type of deployments and, and use other tools in there. I mean, Helm should be an obvious one. You should be able to deploy it with Helm if you can deploy it with manifests. Um, but also what else they have in there from, from CNCF technologies. All right. And thanks everyone for this meeting and see you again in two weeks or in the chat and on the mailing list. Bye everyone. Yeah, bye.